Thank you, Becky. I feel like I'm here amongst such gracious women. There's such a sweet spirit always here. So those that can't be here, those who are on Zoom, we know you're there. We know some of you wish you could be here, but it's just so wonderful to gather in the gospel and to do our version of trying to be one in Christ. And that's what I feel as we come together. So welcome to everyone. Sisters, today's lesson is, as it said on the syllabus, an interesting one. Um, we're going to talk about what Paul said about women. So actually, I'm kind of glad people came because <laughs> I've had some interesting observations and comments over the last few weeks about this lesson. I've had people tell me that their hair on the back of their neck bristles whenever they read anything Paul says about women. I've had people say that they've been so disgruntled and frustrated because it brings such a bad spirit. Um, I've had people wonder if he really truly was an apostle called by God to preach the things that he did. I mean, I've had the gamut of comments, and I, I get every comment. I understand, because I think I've experienced those same feelings. So it's my fervent prayer today, and I'm so grateful for Becky's sweet prayer today, um, that the Spirit will preside here with us as we talk about the things Paul said about women and unpack what the true meanings are. Um, it's all good. Let me just preface it by saying that it's all good. And I hope that when you leave, you are thinking differently or see things through uh, different eyes as the Spirit speaks to you today with our time together here. So, And I do have to say a happy birthday to Cindy Christensen, who's sitting right out there. We're glad you're here on your birthday today. Okay. All right. Paul. You all know who Paul was, the greatest missionary of all. Paul was born in Tarsus. Tarsus is a town that was on the coast. Uh, if you look at a map today, it's present-day Turkey, just the southern coast of that, about where Lebanon meets Turkey. Tarsus was a Rome, excuse me, a Greek center of culture and commerce, but Paul was born a Roman citizen. And in addition to that, he was Jewish, so he spoke Jewish or Hebrew and Greek and Roman. And the scriptures indicate that when the Lord talked to him on his vision uh, on the road to Damascus, that he spoke to him in Aramaic. So that would be four languages. So I think for, right off the start, Paul is a, is a Renaissance man. He learned at the feet of a very famous rabbi named Gamaliel in Jerusalem. And he was an ardent. Are we okay? It's just ringing. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Maybe I'm talking too loud. How's that? Is that any better? Today? Is that any better? If I talk like this, is, that, is the ringing gone? Okay. I think I I'll step back just a bit. Okay. Thanks, Kathy. Um, Paul was an ardent supporter of the, the um, Israelite tradition. He was a Jew's Jew. And so think about this. On the road to Damascus, as he's got letters in hand to go and round up men and women Jews who have converted to Christianity and put them in prison, he's enraged that they would uh, defy their religion. He was converted by the Lord himself. How many people can say that about their conversion? The Lord himself stopped him and taught to him. And ever since then, after that, Paul became an ardent supporter, not only of the Israelite heritage, but also of Christianity. So what an incredible beginning for this man. Here's a description of Paul by Joseph Smith. He's about five feet tall, very dark hair, dark complexion, dark skin, large Roman nose, sharp face, small black eyes, penetrating as eternity, round shoulders, whiny voice, except when elevated, then it almost resembled the roar of a lion. So do you think Joseph knew Paul? Do you think he'd had conversations and interactions with him? Now, Paul did so much to persecute the church initially, and yet, as we said, the Lord came, intervened, and everything changed. And I think it's interesting because the Lord can take a Paul or an Alma the Younger or even a Matthew tax collector. And because of their pre-mortal foreordination, and this is an outgrowth of pre-mortality, the Lord knew what their propensities were. He knew what they were capable of and what their mission was. And Paul is no exception. 
Heavenly Father knew exactly what he needed to have happen after Jesus was resurrected. He needed someone like Paul's personality to take it and run with it, and so he knew what was to take place. And I find that interesting. Elder Maxwell said something that I found years ago I want to share with you. Elder Maxwell said, each mortal, that's you and me, sisters, each mortal is endowed genetically, environmentally, and also pre-mortality. So we've all been given a foreordination endowment. And that's a lesson for another time, but think about the implications of that for your life. And this was certainly Paul's case. And we also know that Satan knew Paul well. Satan was opposed to Paul and the kingdom he was trying to create. Because we have an episode where an evil spirit was inside a man, and the evil spirit said in the same breath, Jesus I know, and Paul I know. And so for Satan to try and create his kingdom, as Jesus is here to create his kingdom, we can just imagine that the hatred and the passion and the anger he directed at Paul. Joseph Smith wrote, Satan knew Paul was destined to prove a disturber and an annoyer of Satan's kingdom. So I think Paul was uh, bigger than life, knowing what his purposes were here on earth. All right, let's talk about chron chronologically how um, the scriptures came about uh, in context with Paul. So we think, depending on what source you read, that Christ was, excuse me, was crucified and resurrected probably about 30 A.D. or maybe 33, depending on the source, and that Paul joined the church a couple years after. So if we said about 35 A.D., which is when some scholars surmise is when he joined the church, then Paul did not begin writing his letters to the branches for another 15 or 20 years. So that would be 35, 45, 50. So 50 AD is about when he began writing the letters that we have in the New Testament. Now, if you think about the four Gospels, um, Mark wrote the very first Gospel, but he didn't write that until about 65 AD. So a good 30 years beyond Paul's conversion. And then Matthew and Luke wrote theirs about 80 AD. And then John wrote his, John the Revelator wrote his about 90. Um, again, 60 years after Christ's resurrection. So what do we have between Christ's resurrection and then when these four Gospels were written? Well, we have the Acts of the Apostles that were recorded, and then we have these letters that Paul wrote to the different branches. Now, um, Paul's letters are very different than the Gospels because the Gospels would write typically to convert people to Christ. That was their purpose, to show that he was, to the Jewish people, he was the Messiah. But Paul's letters are to these branches that have already been established with converted saints. And so his letters are writing to inform them or to instruct them or to reform them because of their behavior. So his letters have a different mission and purpose than the four Gospels. But gratefully, we have them because it gives us um, a more vivid picture of the nascent church and what was happening as Christ had left and these mortal apostles, imperfect as they were, are trying to spread the gospel the best they can. I love that these are imperfect beings trying so hard to do what the Savior has asked them to do, doing it in such imperfect ways, but we have such a beautiful record of it. So I love Paul. And also Paul's writings have to come from accounts from other people. He never met the Savior in person in his mortal life. It was only in that vision. But also I think we have to give Paul credit because he's trying to combine a Jewish culture and a Gentile or a Greek culture. And with churches, especially in Corinth, say we'll take Corinth for, for instance, Corinth, the, the letter to the Corinthians um, was very much letters of instruction and reform because these saints in this little branch lived in a very wicked city. Corinth was on a harbor. Uh, the whole world would come and go as a trade route. It was, someone described it as debauchery, licentiousness, evil, wickedness, idolatry. So I look at these little, this little branch in Corinth trying so hard to live the gospel, and Paul's writing to them, encouraging them, instructing them, teaching them how to keep going. Okay, so given that background um, and what we understand about Paul's mission, but also understanding that when the Savior came, when we've talked about this several times, one of the part, part of his mission was to come and revolutionize how women were viewed. 
And he did that. Women were viewed so differently before the Savior came. And so here's the Savior, knowing that he was no longer going to be on earth, and he calls Paul to take the, ch- take the charge. And do you think for one minute that the Savior would call someone who would preach false doctrine? So in context with what we read in the New Testament of what Paul wrote, we have to understand that the Savior wanted this to be carried on. He wanted his work to continue. He didn't want Paul's version to continue. So whatever Paul's written about women, we it's up to us to, with the Spirit and with some background, understand that he is not trying to um, marginalize women. Quite the opposite. He is a champion of women and of their divine role and of their equality as citizens, both in the church and in the world. So I, I'm hoping that you'll be with me and you'll have a little paradigm shift in your thinking if you've been struggling with Paul to understand that there was purpose in some of the things he wrote about these women, and we're going to talk about them. But just for a minute, let's just talk about some of the inconsistencies that might be bothering you. They've bothered me in the past. Does it make sense that women are seen by Christianity as more prone to the fall, the weaker sex, more fallible, and more tempted, because after all, look at Eve. She was the weaker sex. She was the one that created the fall. And yet women are uh, responsible for upholding sexual virtue. Now, I think this is interesting, and I've actually experienced this. When I was raising my daughter, she was dating a young man, and one day in the store, the father of this young man came up to me and just said, I'm so glad my son's dating your daughter, because she will really keep him on the straight and narrow. And I remember thinking at the time, that's not fair. That's not her responsibility. That's his responsibility. But I think as a society, we tend to look at women as being the keepers of virtue. And and yes, women are the keepers of virtue, but so are men. So I find that a, a paradox for Christians to look at women as the weaker sex, and yet they're supposed to be the strong ones in some situations. Here's another one. Does Paul really teach that wives are to obey their husbands and to be subject to male leadership? Does Paul teach that marriage is based on patriarchy or partnership? Paul affirmed that in Christ there is neither male nor female, yet his words read, wives are to be subject to their husbands. Has that ever bothered anyone? He speaks of women speaking in church, and yet he told Timothy that women were to remain silent in church. What's that all about? Um, Well, it could be that Paul is trying to do a few things. Maybe he's trying to um, combine or amalgamate the ideal and reality. He's, He's presenting something ideal to them, but reality is it may not be that way, and he's trying to combine that. Um, One scholar said maybe he just gives a good line in public, but in private he practices differently. But sisters, today I contend to you that the answer to these inconsistencies and discrepancies is one word, mistranslations. I truly believe that many of Paul's words have been mistranslated. I know that. Um, In fact, the translated words of Paul instead of communicating a clear message of sexual equality and women's divine roles, have become the primary source of degradation for women throughout Christianity. It's as if Christians for centuries have said, "Uh uh-huh, this is what Paul said about women, so this is the way we treat women. This is how they should feel about themselves. And they used his scriptures as that example, when in reality what Paul meant is not what we sometimes interpret his words to be. So keep that in mind as we go. Remember that the Lord had called him um, on his way to Damascus to continue his work. And we know how the Lord feels about women. So here's another theory. Paul's letters were written in Greek, and they've been translated into English. Now for us to take those English translations and put them back into Greek words Sometimes we lose it in translation. We, all of you who have studied new, other languages know that sometimes English doesn't have the same words as another language. So that sometimes has been a hindrance. Um, and also, Paul was subject to the Greek philosophies of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. 
So for 500 years before Christ, the Hellenization of the world or the Greek culture of the world played into the Jewish people and their culture. And many people first read these words as they were written down or decades later with that, seeing it through Greek eyes. And so they see it differently than maybe we do today as Latter-day Saints in this dispensation. Someone once said, the message of the scriptures is divine, but the words in which they are clothed are human. And I think that explains Paul's words exactly. So um, as we go into some of these specific examples, I want you to think about what Jacob taught us in Jacob 4.13 when he said, the Spirit teaches us things as they really are. So come with me now with that spirit, and let's unpack some of the things Paul really said. Um, <clears throat> if you wonder where the idea of where women are inferior or second class to men, all we have to do is look to Eve. And Athelia gave us a beautiful lesson on Eve, and so we're not going to go into that, but remember back a few weeks ago to some of her thoughts there. But also in the context of Greek people, um, it was the goddess Athena, who was the goddess of Athens, the epicenter of Greek culture, that, who was the, the goddess of wisdom and intellect and courage and justice. And it's a paradox because here's this goddess representing all these wonderful things for women, and yet they still maintain that women were second-class citizens. So they're struggling, trying to get it right. Listen to what Paul had to deal with as far as what Socrates said about women. Socrates was about 400 years before Christ. Being born a woman is a divine punishment, since a woman is halfway between a man and an animal. That was the prevailing philosophy. Can you imagine as a woman growing up understanding that? This is what Plato said, his student. Women are to be used for the good of the community, but they are less strong and able than men. And then from Aristotle, we read, a female is a deformed male. And I'm glad you're laughing because when I first read that, I kind of bristled thinking, how dare? And yet, that's what the world was like back then. In fact, I find it interesting that Aristotle was the one who saw a swarm of bees, and there was one single bee leading it to its new hive or creating a new hive. And so he just assumed that was a king bee, and he called it a king bee. And so for centuries, he talked about the king bee leading the swarm of, hive, of bees. It wasn't until centuries later that... Uh, naturalists and scientists learned it was a queen bee. But because the prevailing thought was that men are the greater leaders, then of course it's going to be a king for Aristotle. So all of that in contrast to what Paul said when he said, male and female are one in Christ. So you can see we're struggling with all these discrepancies, aren't we, and inconsistencies as he's trying to turn this battleship around. All right, if you're a woman living in Greek, Greece, at the time, your life was very secluded. You didn't go to school. You were home all the time. You never went out in public. You learned to um, spin and to cook, and you were silent. In fact, um, Pericles was another Greek philosopher. He said, the duty of an Athenian mother is to live so retired a life that her name would never be mentioned among men, either for praise or for shame. That was, that was the ultimate. If you are a Roman woman, you're living a little bit farther west of Greece. You have a few more liberties. And these Roman women were able to go out in public. They were able to go to the marketplace. They had education, but it wasn't as important as men's education. But they were much freer in their vicinity to come and go as they pleased. And still, Roman women experienced exposure. And I believe we talked about this. This was in the Roman society. If you had a female child, and you didn't want her, you could give her up to the elements, or the dogs, or the animals, or the birds. They'd put them in a box, put the baby by the wayside, and go on with their life, because they had too many daughters. That was called exposure, and Roman society still practiced that. If you were an Egyptian woman, it was vastly different. Um, a historian went to Egypt and was stunned at what he wrote. Egyptians seem to have reversed the ordinary practices of mankind. Women attend open market. They empl in, are employed in trade, while men stay home and do the weaving. 
Egyptian women had legal rights. They sat on juries. They had property rights. They could sign their own legal documents. It was a complete reversal. So why were the Hel was the Hellenized world so much more prevalent, and we don't learn so much about the Egyptians? Um, one scholar has suggested that maybe the Egyptians didn't leave us a philosophical heritage like the Greeks did. We have so much of our contemporary society that comes from Greek thought. And so Aristotle is at the feet of, Aris excuse me, Alexander the Great is at the feet of Aristotle um, learning Greek culture just before he goes out and Hellenizes the world. So of course he's going to take his thoughts from these Greek leaders. Okay, let's see. Um, so here's Paul. He's with this Greek society that is ever-present. He's been taught Christianity and what the true worth of women is, and he's trying to change all of that. He's trying to Christianize the Hellenized word, and it's hard. Now, we mentioned that his rabbi was named Gamaliel. You'll read about him in the scriptures. But Gamaliel tells a wonderful story that gives us a glimmer of hope at this time in the world. So this is a story that Gamaliel tells. An emperor was visiting and accused a Jewish man by saying, Your God is a thief. In order to make a woman, he had to steal a rib from a man. And the Jewish man just didn't know how to respond to that, but his daughter did. And she went up to the emperor and she said, We demand justice. And the emperor said, What for? And the daughter said, Thieves broke into our house last night and took away the silver ewer. Do you remember a ewer is a pitcher? They left a gold one in its place. And the emperor said, I wish I could have thieves like that every night at my house. And the daughter said, well, that is what our God did. He took a mere rib from a man, and in exchange, he gave him a wife. So there's a glimmer of hope that things might change as Gamaliel's teaching that to his people. And all of this, I think, reflects what Paul said when he says, neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. Okay, so for the next little while, let's just talk about some of the things that Paul said. We can't go through everything he said that causes our eyebrows to raise a bit, but we have some of the things that might be more prevalent that have um, come up the most. And I think the very first one we need to address is in Ephesians chapter 5. This is Paul's version of what a new role looks like for husbands and wives. Now think about this. All the things we just heard about how women were treated, how they were upheld in their home by their husbands, by society. Paul's trying to change that and teach both husbands and wives what their new role is as a Christian. I think about the apostles often who were part of the Greek Jewish culture and loved the Savior and tried to become Christian and then went home and still had their own um, mores to work out amongst in their marriage. And so Paul's trying to teach everyone, these are your new roles as a Christian wife and a Christian husband. Um, let's start with Ephesians chapter 5, and we're going to go to verse 21 and 30 to 33. Three words stand out that we're going to talk about, and I think once we understand these three words, then it changes the meaning of everything. So the first word we'll talk about is head. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Now, that may or may not make you feel a little squeamish, but let's think about the word head for a minute. When I say to you the word head, what do you think of? Do you think of the top of your body and maybe the, the leader of a corporation, the head? Okay, in Greek, there are two words that mean head. The first one is arche, A-R-C-H-E. Arche means the head in terms of leadership, a boss, a ruler, a chief. Arche means the beginning, as in archaeology or archives. Um, arche means the point of origin, like a headwater. Arche can mean the first, as in archangel or archbishop. So head, first, origin, uh, chief, ruler. If Paul believed husbands should command their wives, then he would have used that word, arche, but he didn't. He used another word for head in Greek, kaphale, or kaphale, however you say it. 
kaphale. Kaphale also means head, but in this sense. Head means as part of one's whole body, so it's a part of something bigger. It means foremost in terms of support, like a capstone or a cornerstone that supports an edifice, kaphale. It means working towards the same goal. So kaphale is being part of something that's bigger than yourself, working towards the same goal. In the military terms, kaphale, meaning head, doesn't mean a leader taking his battalion out to fight. It means someone who goes ahead and he checks for booby traps and snipers and bombs to make sure that his battalion is safe. That's a kaphale. And so if we talk about Paul saying that husbands should be kaphale of their wives, this is the head he's talking about. And this is no different than what we find in our proclamation on the family. Let me read that to you. Fathers are to preside over their families in love, righteousness, and women are responsible for the nurture of their children. These sacred responsibilities, fathers and mothers, are obligated to help one another as equal partners. Catholic. So that makes that changes everything for a husband being Catholic of his wife. Not head as in chief, ruler, directing, but head as in protecting, being bigger than one uh, the, than everything, um, supporting. There's a two there are two very distinct meanings in the Greek word head. Okay. The next word is subject or be subjected to. So there are three instances in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 21, 22, and 23. Paul says, church members submit to one another. Do we submit to each other in our efforts to fulfill our callings, be Christians? Verse 22, wives, submit to your husbands. Verse 24, church, submit to Christ. Now, I can feel good about those except for the first one. It just seems like we are... Um, isolated, that we are the ones to submit without mention of husbands submitting to wives. But this is what Paul said. The word submit in Greek that Paul used is hupotasame. Hupotasame. And this submit means to um, be responsive to, to have allegiances for, to attend to their needs, to be supportive. So when he's asking wives to hupotasame their husbands, be responsive to them, attend to their needs, um, support them. The best translation of this is the German translation because it says that hupotasame means placing oneself at the disposition of. So think of a marriage, a wife placing oneself at the disposition of her husband. My husband's here in the back. Hupotasme. I hope I hupotasme my husband. <laughs> and he hopes he does the same thing. He just gestured that. Okay, so this is how we would read verse 21. Church members are to hupotasme one another. Verse 22, wives are to support, be allegiant to, um, tend to the needs of their husband. Church is to the, do the same for Christ. So that changes it, doesn't it? There's a, a sweeter spirit of love than this perfunctory marching order, this is how wives are to submit to their husbands. No, the word is hupotasme, and in Greek that's a very different meaning than our English word. Okay, the third word that we have here is love. And we know that there's diff different words in Greek that mean love. Eros is sexual love, and philio is, what, friendship. But the word that's used the most in the New Testament is agape which means um, it implies an attitude or action. It's not complacent. It's the agape that we use for the great commandment, to love one another. It's used to say to love God, to agape God. It's the Good Samaritan kind of love. And the best news of all is that agape is, syn is synonymous with hupotasame. So agape, hupotasame, both mean to support, to be allegiant to, to um, attend to needs, to be responsive, 
to place oneself in a disposition to support. Okay? That shifts something, doesn't it? It brings a, it brings a, a feeling of love into the nuance of what that means. Um, okay, so any questions about that? I know that that sometimes is a frustrating thing. But for just a minute, what I'd like to do is reread Ephesians chapter 5, verses 21 through 33. And as you read your scriptures of how it was translated that Paul said it, I'm going to insert these new words and see if it brings a different flavor to what we've just talked about. So Ephesians chapter 5, verses 21. Be supportive of one another. 22. Wives, be supportive, responsive to, tend to the needs to your husbands, as of the Lord. 23, for the husband is kafale, or head, of the wife, that is, risking or sacrificing for her. In the same way, Christ is the head, or kafale, of the church, by being Savior of the whole body. Verse 24, but as the church is hupotasime, or supportive of Christ, so let wives be hupotasame of their husbands in everything. 25, <clears throat> excuse me. Husbands, be responsive to the needs of your wives, as Christ has been to the church and gave himself up for her. 26, in order that he might make her holy, cleansing her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present the church to himself in all glory without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. 28. So husbands all also ought also to respond to the needs of their wives as to their own bodies. I think that's a euphemism for sexual relations. He who responds to the needs of his own wife is responding to his own needs. 29. For no man ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it as Christ does the church. 30. For because we are members of his body. 31. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one. 32. This mystery, and the mystery is taking a man and a woman and making them one. That's what he's talking about. This mystery is great, but I say in reference to Christ and the church. 33. However, let each and every one of you respond to the needs of his wife as to his own needs, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Now, if you read it with those translations in mind, would you understand this passage differently? Would there be a difference in the way you read the words of Paul? But can you see the master-slave relationship coming in from the Greek culture? That's what they understood. They knew that master-slave paradigm, and that's kind of how they read that. Until we understand it through Christ's words and Christ's spirit, it changes everything as we bring Christ into it. Okay, and... Also, I wrote this down, Paul's model of marriage places the highest possible value on marriage, patterning his marriage after the bond between the Savior and those whom he loved more than life itself. So think about that in terms of marriage, the bond between the Savior and those whom he loved more than life itself. I think this is a powerful thought for changing the implications of that passage. Okay, let's see. Um, now Paul talked about a new model for marriage in addition to the roles of them, just what marriage was to look like in society. Again, Christ is the cathole of the church, but he became that by giving himself up for the church, by serving, not being the arche, the head, the chief, the ruler, but by serving. And the scriptures teach us that was the Savior's mission. Matthew said, even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. So a premise of a healthy marriage is that service. And then um, I think Paul's just simply saying it's the golden rule. Be one with one another. Attend to each other's needs. Be faithful to each other. Serve each other. Um, I think this is what makes a healthy marriage. But remember, in Jewish terms, a woman was first her father's daughter, and then she became her husband's wife, and then her son's mother, as if she were property. So Paul's trying to change that. And then, oh, I found this great scripture in 1 Corinthians. A woman shall have authority on her own head. And the word he uses for head is kaphale, which to me means be kind to yourself. 
Okay, let's go on. Um, what about women belonging in church? In Jewish times, women did not attend synagogues. Rarely did they ever. And if they attended, there was either a veil that separated the men and the women, or they sat on the perimeter and just watched and observed what men's um, actions and participations were. They weren't a whole part of that experience. So here's Paul coming trying to create these branches all over the Near East, trying to get women, and we know how Paul, um, or how the Savior loved women and all of the women that participated in this new church. We have Paul who went to Philippi and met Lydia, and she was starting her own little prayer group, and she started the Philippian branch. And we have Paul whose um, peer was Prisca in Corinth and Ephesus and Rome. They started house, house churches. And Paul who wrote letters about all the women and the patrons that were submitting their finances and their money and their time to supporting this kingdom and building up these branches. So we know Paul needed women to create these different branches. So Paul was... Paul even spoke in 1 Corinthians about women prophesying and praying in church. So to hear some of these statements about Paul, about women not being part of church, seems like another great discrepancy. In fact, in the third century, a historian wrote this about all the women who helped begin this new church. He said, These were noble women, hindered in no way by their sex. And this is as might be expected. For, And then he quotes Paul. For in Christ, there is neither male nor female. So I think Paul's making some inroads here. Um, okay, let's go to women is the glory of man. Paul wrote that in 1 Corinthians eleven seven. 7. For the woman is the glory of man. Now, again, in our 21st century lenses, we look at that. And with feminism and radical rights and whatnot, we go, wait a second. But sisters, this is what God said himself when he said, it is not good for man to be alone that Eve was created for Adam. But let's look at it this way. Paul's trying to say that women are not distractions like the Essenes thought they were. That was a philosophical thought um, culture in Jesus' time. He's saying women aren't sex objects like Greeks thought they were. He's saying women are to be glorified by men. This was the Christian view. And then he says um, Adam needed Eve from the very beginning. And we know that for um, Adam and Eve cannot make it to the highest degree. They can't be exalted without each other. God even said, it is not good for man to be alone. And Paul wrote, neither woman without the man, nor the man without the woman in the Lord. So trying to unify and be one, as opposed to this Greek culture that was saying differently. And I love the old notion where it, Women are inferior to men because of Eve, um, because Eve was created out of Adam's rib. Well, we know that that's figurative. President Kimball taught us that. That's just figurative. It didn't really happen that way. But I have a question for you. If Eve is inferior to Adam because she was created from his body, does that make men inferior to their mothers because they were created from their bodies? Something to think about, isn't it? We wonder what would have happened to the worldview of women if Adam had taken that forbidden fruit. That may have changed a lot of things. Okay, another one Paul said often is women are to keep silent in church. Now, what's that all about? He says, let your women keep silent in the churches. Um, this just may nuance what Aristotle said when he said a woman's glory is her silence. Maybe he's trying to reflect that in some way to capture his audience. Who knows? But the word silence, again, is another mistranslation. They have several words for silence. They have a word called fimu, and that's a demand silence, like someone's yelling to a, a noisy room, silence, be quiet, shut up. That's fimu, but Paul did not use that word. The word he used was sigeo, S-I-G-A-O, and that means being silent in order to listen or to learn. And this is the same segeo that he used when he described Christ during his trial, when Christ was silent. Or the same silence that the three apostles experienced at the Mount of Transfiguration, when they were silent to observe and to learn. 
And so Paul uses that to say women should be segeo in church to learn. And this is one reason why I found the greatest article that explains this perfectly. I think this may have been what was happening in Jerusalem. This is written by a missionary's daughter. These, her mother and father were missionaries in China, not of our faith. My mother used to compare the situation in Corinth to the one she and my father faced in China. Back in the 1920s, when they were first to bring God's message, they found women with bound feet who were seldom, who seldom left their homes and who, like the men, unlike the men, had never in their whole lives attended a public meeting or lecture. They'd never been told as little girls, now you must sit still and listen to the teacher and be reverent. Their only concept of an assembly was a family feast where everyone talked at once. When these women came to my parents' church and gathered on the woman's side of the sanctuary, they thought this was a chance to catch up on the news with the neighbors and ask questions about the story of Jesus that they were hearing. Needless to say, along with babies crying and toddlers running about, the women's section got rather noisy. Add to that the temptation for the women to shout questions to their husbands across the aisle, and you can imagine the chaos. As my mother patiently tried to tell the women that they should listen first and chit-chat or ask questions later, she would mutter under her breath, it's just like Corinth. It just couldn't be any different than Corinth. So I think Paul is telling these women who are not used to being in synagogues like their men, be quiet, listen quietly, be reverent. It's the golden rule again. You have much to learn. Don't shout out answers. I think there's one passage where Paul says, don't ask questions. Go home and ask your husband questions. I can just imagine women saying, I don't get that. What was that? That didn't mean anything to me. As all men have had years of tutorials and the women are just coming onto it for the first time. It's a new religion. They've got lots of curiosity. So maybe this is Paul's way of saying, Sigeo, quietly listen and you will learn. Um, another one is Timothy, or excuse me, Paul said, let a woman learn in silence with all subjection. He told that to Timothy. Well, again, Sigeo, let them learn quietly, but subjection, again, he uses the same word, hupotasame, be subject attend to the needs of, listen to, support as you're listening, trying to learn. So all of this to say that we're just simply supposed to be hupotasame to each other in reverence for Christ as we come to church and listen. I don't think Paul was trying to condemn women. I think he welcomed them, but he's trying to teach them what the normal behavior would be in a worshipful place. Paul also talked about women being saved in childbearing. What's that all about? Does that mean you can only be saved if you have a child? Does it mean that if you have children and you raise them in a faithful household that you will be saved? Um, is it an implication of what women who, remember we talked about this when we talked about Asherah, that women would hold these little teraphims as they were in labor, crying out to Asherah, the mother God, to please save them. So, women, so many women lost their lives in childbirth. So maybe Paul was trying to comfort them, that, encourage them, they will be saved in childbirth. Or was Paul simply trying to teach them, women ha are heir to salvation just like men are. But um, maybe it's through Christ that they are saved. It's through Christ, their faith in Christ that they're saved. We don't know. Paul just simply teaches that it's through Christ's birth that we are all spiritually saved. Um, Paul talked about dress and hairstyles. He asked them not to put pearls in their hair. And pearls were probably the very most costly gem that they could find. And so he's asking them to be temperate. He may have asked them not to put yellow in their hair because they were dyeing their hair yellow. Well, prostitutes in Greece were dyeing their hair yellow. So maybe he was saying, don't be a reflection of something that's that evil. Um, again, I'm thinking back to when I was in Young Women's and our bishop would tell me, we got to teach these women how to dress. Some of our young women are not being dressing modestly. I had no problem with that because I felt like that was part of my role. Just like Paul, seeing these women trying to rear them as one of Christ would want them to dress modestly. Did Paul talk about celibacy? Or did he address sexual customs? It seems like this was all over the map as we talk about some of these facets. Um, the, the, did the culture dictate marriage was seen only as a means to provide children? Was adultery punishable by death? Yes. Were women property of their husbands? Yes. Um, in Greece, prostitutes were, for husbands was a norm. 
but not for women. There carried no stigma for a, a Roman husband. Our Roman husbands were to expect wives to be faithful, but they had not the same standards for themselves. Mistresses and concubines were prevalent in the Greek and Roman society. Um, Paul's answer to all of this sexual um, chaos was that sexual intimacy belongs in the confines of marriage. And what I find interesting is that no philosophy and no religion had taught that precept at the, up to this point. The Greek religions, the Roman religions, with all of their gods and goddesses, never taught that it was to be, con be confined to the moral morality of marriage. So again, what Christ would have taught had he been here. Well, it's, it would be a difficult task to Christianize this Hellenized world and to convince people to turn their thinking to something that was new to them. Um, but Paul was up to the task, and the Lord knew that, and that's why he was called on the road to Damascus. Paul knew the Savior, he embraced his gospel, he loved his fellow men and his fellow women, and his eye was single to his mission. And even though Paul attempted to bring both Jew and Gentile into the family of God, he knew that it wouldn't be easy, but he tried to establish it anyway, establishing an equality of membership in the kingdom and equality in a marriage. I think Paul was successful. Because two centuries later, a philosopher named Tertullian wrote this, as he observed both men and women in church in Israel. They perform their tasks, mutually teaching, mutually exhorting, mutually sustaining. Equally, they are both found in the church of God, equally in straits, in persecutions, in refreshments. Neither hides from the other, neither shuns the other, neither is troublesome to the other. So there was some measure of success. And it's interesting that it wasn't until after the apostles died, the apostasy had begun, that women began to be silenced in church. And the culture of the church began to change. You think about the centuries of early Christianity and how women are portrayed as being silent members of what took place. That all began to change once the apostles had died and once Paul had gone. So he had tried to turn that battleship around he had some success, and then the apostasy took over. Now, sisters, in our remaining time, I'd like to share a scripture with you that Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 14.10. He said, There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. So many voices these people were trying to listen to, whether they were Greek, Gentile, Roman, Jew, but I'd like to share with you a voice that we can listen to today from our prophets, our Latter-day prophets. This is what they've taught us as we listen to the Spirit and what we understand about the value of women in our Father's eyes. Um, Elder Russell Ballard said, Sisters, we, your brethren, cannot do what you were divinely designated to do from before the foundation of the world. We may try, but we cannot ever hope to replicate your unique gifts. There is nothing in this world as personal, as nurturing, or as life-changing as the influence of a righteous woman. I embrace that, and I believe that. I've seen that in my life, and I'm grateful for that. This is from Elder Holland. I'm grateful for all the women of the church who, in my life, have been as strong as Mount Sinai and as compassionate as in the Mount of Beatitudes. And this from President Nelson. Um, excuse me, this is from President Kimball. You've all heard this many times, I'm sure. Much, and think about our day today, much of the major growth that is coming to the church in the last days, and this was given us, to us 40 years ago, much of the major growth that's coming in the last days will come because many of the good women of the world will be drawn to the church in large numbers. This will happen to the degree that the women of the church reflect righteousness and articulateness in their lives, and to the degree that the women of the church are seen as distinct and different in happy ways from the women of the world. And fi finally, from our prophet, attacks against the church, its doctrine, and the way of life are going to increase. Because of this, we need women who have a bedrock understanding of the doctrine 
who will use that understanding to teach and help raise a sin-resistant generation. We need women who can detect deception in all its forms. We need women who know how to access the power that God makes available to covenant keepers and who express their beliefs with confidence and charity. We need women who have the courage and vision of Mother Eve. Today, I plead with my sisters, step forward. Take your rightful and needful place in your home, in your community, in the kingdom of God, more than you ever have before. I plead with you to fulfill President Kimball's prophecy, and I promise you in the name of Jesus Christ that as you do so, the Holy Ghost will magnify your influence in an unprecedented way. I'm going to listen to those voices. I'm going to listen to what the Spirit teaches me about what Paul really said about women as he was trying to replicate the Savior's works. Sisters, I'd like to bear my testimony to you before this class is over. This has been a privilege for me to come with you each week, feel your spirits, feel your earnestness, feel your desire to learn, and to feel your love for these four mothers of ours. I am so grateful for their examples. I'm grateful we have record of them. I'm, there's so many more that someday we'll get to know them and meet them and learn from them. But for now, we just have these, and we're going to just relish every word that we hear about them. I hope that I will change my life as a result. I hope that I can see the Savior through their lives as I want to change my life to be like the Savior's. I am, I am indebted to my Savior for what he's done for me. I am indebted to the victory that he won on the cross, both over death and for my sins. Where would our lives be if we didn't have that knowledge? I know the Savior would have done it anyway, but for us to have the understanding of his love, his divine love for us is beyond comprehension, that we are so blessed. I testify to you that these words are true, that what the Savior taught us was only because he loved us so much, that the men and the women that tried to create his kingdom on earth did the best they could. Someday we'll be able to meet them, hug them, shake their hands, and say thank you. Because of them, we have become more like our Savior. And I say this in his name, even Jesus Christ. Amen.